to all the military. The men at the front. And all the forces under their control. And their righteous might. Strong, healthy, formidable men. Many of them going into battle for the first time. These are a few of the impressions which I'll never forget. I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. I enjoyed growing up there. Well, when I grew up, Kansas City was a peaceful town. We didn't have to lock our doors. At summertime, we slept on the front porch, you know, and didn't worry about nothing. I grew up with my mom, a brother, and four sisters. We fought just like any regular family, but we loved each other. My mom would do, do anything for us. She was a great mom. I'll, I'll never forget her. And my sisters, heck, they get mad at me. And they have my other brother, he'd say, tell him to beat me up or vice versa. But we, we, you know, we never did that. But we grew up in a, in a nice family. I went to grade school at Douglas. Then I went to West Junior High School. And I went there till the 10th grade. It was, and then I went to regular high school, the 9th, no, the 11th and 12th grade. I seen racism in high school. They had uh, just integrated schools just before I went to high school. And, and I chose my, my high school. I, we had a choice. Where I lived, I could go to Westport or Manuel High School. I went to Manuel because there was more blacks there. We still have reunions. Our class, our class is still, it's about 60 of us are still together. We meet every five years. And two, two of them, we went from kindergarten on up through high school. And, uh, you know, naturally, all that time, we, we, you know, we, we're good friends. In November of 1961, when I joined the Air Force, I enlisted because Kansas City had changed. A lot of my friends was, you know, wanted to get in gangs and stuff. They started having gangs. I didn't want that kind of life. So I joined the service and just got away from it. The first day I got there and they first screamed at me and hollered at me and then took me in and cut all my hair off my head. I realized it was different. I didn't have a choice on it. But well, I mean, boot camp was okay, but even when I remember what I remember the most when you went, to, when I'm used to eating what I wanted to eat, you go to boot camp, whatever you take, whether you like it or not, they, they expected you to eat it. I, I mean, I, I remember that experience and getting up at five o'clock in the morning for training. I adapted very well to military life. I, uh, I got promoted pretty good, and I, I met friends there, and I was assigned. Wait, I put in for aircraft mechanic. They put me in the fire department and told me I was in the mechanical career field. I became a fireman. I was in the fire department and crash rescue, because I what, you might as well make the best of it. And, and I, I really in, did end up enjoying it. I love driving them big trucks. <laughs> and, uh, and then I eventually moved up to where I was crew chief in the trucks. You know, and, you know, I had somebody driving for me when I, I got some rank. And I enjoyed it. I took my first airplane flight while after I was in the service. When I went to Spain, and they was fitting to have a training over there for some aircraft training exercises and they didn't have enough firemen over there so they'd have and they would have enough guys in case something happened to cover it and so I got to go to Spain for two weeks I mean I re-enlisted and I found out in uh, 1964 it was in the winter time and they told me I was going to Vietnam instead of Spain I was stationed at Natrang, Vietnam in about 63, I start hearing about Vietnam. I just heard they were fighting over there and that's all I knew. And in 65, I actually went there. My first day in Vietnam. Tell you the truth, the first day in Vietnam, we, we stopped in Saigon, I think it was. 
and spent the night and, and we didn't, well, I mean, we just ate and, and we didn't do nothing, really. And then, 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 then I don't know if you want to talk about the next day, but then we flew to where I was going to in the train. And I was nervous because I, you know, I was wondering whether they going to shoot the plane down or not. But they didn't do it. It was, it was hot all the time. It never got cold. It was, it was hot in Vietnam all the time. And we had a raining season. They called monsoon. It would rain. And some of the natives, on the way they could, the water would be this high in there, in, in there. It would be two foot high in there, in there where they stayed. The only way they could get out of the water was get in the bed to get up out of the water. I don't know why they stayed there, but they did. But it was, it was just hot all the time or raining or raining. A lot of mosquitoes. We had a barracks about the size of this room and bunks, you know, and, and, and I forgot how many guys was in, in there. I think it was about 20 of us into, in, 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 a, in, a, in a big room. And, and each one of us had our own little area where you had a locker to keep your stuff in the, and you had a bed. And like I bought me a reel to reel tape, you know, everybody would be in there listening to their music, but you know, most of them would respect the other guy and wouldn't have his music too loud. It was a little different from, from, from an Air Force base here because the buildings was more primitive. But we, we had our flight lines and we had, uh, you know, places for our planes to park and gasoline, instead of our gasoline being underground, it was in rubber bladders you know, in just a certain area. And, and, they, and they, had, they had certain areas where they had 50, 50 caliber machine guns set up, you know, in case the enemy showed up. You had all, all your, air, your aircraft mechanics and your pilots and, and uh, you had nurses and you had your, your WAFs which is the women, you know, in the in Air Force, you had them there, and uh, Vietnamese, you know, quite a few of them was on base, because a lot of them worked, on, they worked for the government. We had, Army, we had Army guys on the base, you know, fifth Special Forces, sometimes Marines, and you had Koreans that was helping us fight that war. And, 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 and they, they would be on the base a lot of times. I was in Vietnam ten and a half months, and, and, I, and during that time, I dealt with about two crashes, actual crashes. But you know, we dealt with emergencies every day. Building fire, you know, fire department. We, if, if we had a building catch fire, we had to deal with that. Grass fire sometime, and uh, giving people CPR, first aid. We, you know. Like I was in the dining hall and a guy slipped and fell and busted his head open. And not all the way open, but, but, but he was bleeding bad. I, I should put it that way. And it was my job to get up and help him. Stop his bleeding till, till the medics got there. We would actually race and try to be the first one there. We'd have, and, uh, we would actually try to be the first one there to see if we could help someone. We were just wanting to help who we could help and get them out and would hope they were still alive. Oh, while I was there, I didn't, wasn't involved in but one real bad crash. It, it, it killed a few people, but we saved a lot of people that day that was trapped up in buildings because it crashed on the main street. And, uh, that was my worst experience over there. We worked 24 on it, and then we stayed off for 24 hours. And time, most time I was off, we'd go off the base. And I'd done some traveling over there. We could get on a plane, just hop on a plane and go to Saigon, or Play Coup is another place we stopped at. We got, uh, we got, we did get R&R &R while we were resting recuperation, they call it. And, and I didn't have to go to work for that week. 
and, and I, I spent it going to the beach. We, it, it had beaches over there. And I swam out in the South China Sea and, and laid up in my bunk. Now, a lot of guys left and went to Hong Kong or somewhere, but I chose to just stay there. What was my friends like? They were, they, most of them was nice guys. And I can't remember nobody, no, none of them in, the room, in, there, in there that wasn't. And uh, most of them, not most of them, all of them, I, I, I can't remember having no problems with any of them. They were nice guys. Amongst us, you know, you disagree sometimes, but it wasn't no fighting. No, I, I never, never seen no fighting amongst us. So we depended on each other. Just doing our thing, because we didn't know what was going on, not even with the war. But that, that's, that's what it was like. Everybody was just one big family in a big room. <laughs> but uh, they were, they were, they were, were nice guys. You're not going to agree with everybody all the time. But regardless whether you disagreed or not, you could depend on it. I could depend on every one of them. Shelby, he was a real good friend. We, uh, he bought a motorcycle while we was there. We used to go motorcycle riding and, and we'd go to the beaches and it, 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 we'd play cards and stuff together. A lot of, a lot of time we'd play play cards, you know, my friends, sometimes for money and sometimes for fun. <laughs> we had to be friends and, and, and keep each other's back. Because you go out in that woods and, and you get shot, don't nobody know who shot you. And sometimes our guys would have bad communications and get to shooting at each other. They done that. Firing started all over the place. He walked straight ahead into what appeared to me to be a hail of fire. When the great moment came. Yeah, I don't know if you know what a mortar is or not. It's, it's about this long, shaped like a bullet. It, they lob it and hit and explode. Metal goes everywhere. And uh, we had our sand bunkers we would get behind, you know, to keep the metal from getting you. <laughs> Break them on. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I actually would react. We, and we was actually in a building where we slept, and it would wake us up. We'd get our weapon, and, and, and we had the bunkers outside. You had to go out. Some of the guys would go up and go to the back of the line. They didn't want to be the first one to go out. But most of us just went on out there and got in the bunker. During my time over there, I seen that happen about four or five times, period. It, didn't, it wasn't no everyday thing. Because we had guys, most of the time, we had guys per, per protecting the perimeter of our base. Then most of the time they didn't get on there, but every once in a while they did. We had a reconnaissance plane go over and uh, take a picture. And, you know, I don't, if you, the flash bulb, you imagine a flash bulb on a camera? This is a great big flash bulb. And that went off, and we thought we was being bombed, but it was flash bulb off a of reconnaissance. And yeah, I, w I was nervous then. But my, I wouldn't take nothing for my Air Force life. It was, it, it was a good life. They treated me fair, and, and I met a lot of good friends. I had a brother in the Air Force at Altus Air Force Base in Oklahoma and he got killed down there. And I came home a month and a half early. A guy cut him, an army guy. But my brother's wife was right there and seen it. Oh, <laughs> my heart, I, I, was, I was sad. It, it, his sadness. The Red Cross notified me. And then they put me on a plane and flew me home. I didn't get to see my friends again. I didn't get it. I didn't get a chance to get their addresses. Well, we, we flew commercial, and we got on plane and we flew and we stopped in Guam and refueled, and then we stopped in Hawaii. We seen Hawaii for a little bit, and then 
on home. You leave there on Tuesday, and when you arrive in the United States in San Francisco, it's still Tuesday on account of the timeline. But the, it was just a normal flight. When we come back from Vietnam, we were just back, you know. Wasn't nobody meeting you or greeting you or no excitement or nothing. I, I, had, to, I had to pay to fly to Kansas City. I got, I got to San Francisco. That's what, that's what they brought me to San Francisco, and then I had to get on to Kansas City on my own. My first day back was just meeting my folks and seeing my people again and hugging and, and, and eating and drinking a little beer. And <laughs> my biggest support system was my family. Because outside of my family, there was no support system. My mother had five brothers, and, and, and they were there, and, and plus her, plus my mom. And, and you know, my brother, had, my, my uncles had wives, and my aunts were too. Yeah, my sisters and my brother was younger than I was, so they still needed my advice. I was always treated fine. I was always treated okay. I was treated fine. I was treated... I guess because I wasn't around none of the protesters or anti-war anti except John going to war. Now I had, my mom and them didn't want me to go. They need to, to, to learn that our guys, some of them, they're not over there by choice. Most of them are not over there by choice. And to back them regardless. If, you're, if your men are in war, stand behind them. But, uh, other than that, I, I wasn't around none of the anti-war protests. I never seen any of them. Civil rights leader Martin Luther King leads the procession to the United Nations where he urges UN pressure to force the U.S. to stop bombing North Vietnam. You know, naturally you don't, you don't like it. You want to get along with everybody, but I didn't care for it. I was in Kansas City. I experienced it there before the 60s even, but uh, I didn't get to see too much of that. We didn't get uh, exposed a lot to, to tell you the truth, I didn't really see it in Vietnam. I, I didn't. What, most of what I seen was on TV. Like people go downtown to stores and they wouldn't let you eat at the certain counters or certain areas. My own government for the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence. I cannot be silent. I think he helped a bunch of, a lot of people. I think it helped black and white and Mexicans and Japanese and whatever with equality. Protests with no violence, I, I, I think that was wonderful because you don't have to have all that violence. When I was in the Air Force, I didn't, I didn't Luke Air Force Base in Arizona. And I attempted to buy a home and, and they wouldn't sell it to me because the area was in. They didn't want me in that area. They took the for sale signs down. And, and I just didn't pursue it anymore. I just went somewhere else and bought me a house. And it was, it was, it was a mixed neighborhood. And I had nice, nice neighbors then. <laughs> I've been blessed not to really be affected by it, except the experience I told you a while ago. I got married the first time, I think it was around 66, and we stayed married eight years. And then, and that ended, we had one son. And that, and that ended, and I stayed single for three years. And I remarried and married the wife I got now. See, my wife that I'm married to now is my second wife. I met my wife in Kansas City, Missouri in 1975. We got married June 24th, 1978. Last June was 38 years ago, and, and we've been happily married ever since. And when we married, she had two sons from a previous marriage, and I had one, and we raised the three boys and they're, they're doing fine in Kansas City right now. You couldn't have asked for a better wife than I got. I, after I got out of the service, the hardest part was getting a decent job. 
I went to Bendix and I got trained as a pipe fitter. And Bendix laid off. When they laid off, I went on construction for a year. Then I applied for a job at General Motors and they shut General Motors down in Kansas City. And I chose to come to Janesville to, go to keep working. That Agent Orange was a terrible thing. The way I was exposed, they uh, had barrels. They, they'd fly them in the planes, and they wouldn't have bongs in them barrels, and it would splatter in the plane, and I'd have to take a fire truck out there and wash the plane out. I don't think they knew. I don't think they knew the dangers of it, and I know I didn't. If I had known, I'd have had on rubber suits and, <laughs> and all of that, but I was 20 years old then. And, I didn't care if it got on me. I got cancer from it. Multiple myeloma, which they can't cure, but they can control it. They're doing good. From blood work, I'm in remission. See, this is my second time this come back, because see, in 2011, I had it. See, my wife had to take care of me for two years. I was down, almost in bed for two years. And, and she was right there between her and, and the doctor. They, they couldn't ask for no better. A lot of guys done died from it, but I'm blessed to still be here and doing good. Vietnam ain't nothing like the United States. It made me Loved the United States that much more. I never was on no front line. I was, I was shot at. That, that happened to me, but actually I had my weapon and ready to fire, but they never got close enough for me to fire. I was blessed I didn't have to shoot anyone. I was never, I would have if I had had to, but I wouldn't put in that position. And I, I thank God I wasn't. Yep, yes I do, I think, I think, and next is how did it change me? I think it made me more of a man. I don't have no regrets for serving because I was doing something for, for my country. I was, let me see, I was about 22, 23 years old and thought I wanted excitement. But now I'm, I'm glad I didn't have all that excitement. Adjusting back to you know, regular life, I didn't, I didn't have no problem doing that. And, and I give that credit for not having to hurt no one while I was over there. I, I know there's no problem in joining the service. We don't, we, we go, we're going to always have, be threatening war, but I think right now it's not too many of us in war. I know we're still, in, we're still over there in some countries, but I think going into the service has saved a lot of young men's lives too by just not being out here on the streets and in gangs and, and so forth. My, my, my brother was one of them as an example. He went in the Air Force. And uh, it, it saved him, I mean, it kept him from getting in trouble, you know, back in Kansas City. Other than that, the whole experience was, it was, it was a nice experience. I've always been told that I'm very good at creating things and making things into something beautiful. But this is quite different. Creating something powerful and meaningful for just one man who has protected mine and others' freedoms in serving is a tremendous honor to me. I honestly never expected this much out of a class, let alone to feel such a way about a person I had never met and I never knew, but now I do not knowing anything about film or creation of documentaries, videos, music, voiceovers, anything is quite intense to just jump into a project, but I'm glad that I was thrown in. I remember when I first received John Page's raw interview, it was very interesting to watch. 
I didn't know what to expect. All I knew was his name on a piece of paper said John Page, veteran, Air Force, Vietnam. Based only on words found on a paper, I was able to connect John Page with my grandfather, who also served in Vietnam, but later died before I was born. That gave me all I needed to know in order to pick him, and with the help of a friend who recommended him to me, I was lucky enough to get him. Being able to have John Page as a veteran that I can call my own because of the doc that I'm making is a wonderful feeling because it links me and my grandfather together. Although I know their separate experiences were fairly different, they were still connected in fighting the same war around the same time. The individual experience and life of John Page has enriched my own. I have been enlightened just by seeing through his eyes and through his perspective to truly understand what a soldier is and that there is not just one conformity to be a soldier. To me, he is everything. He is the family man. He is the soldier. He is the one that I picture defending our freedoms and protecting my rights as an American. I also picture him as the all-American man who has a lovely family, who has a lovely life, and who has gone through struggles much like the rest of America, but is also the exception because he is a, an exceptional person. I didn't really know what to expect coming into this and being new to the Harlem Veteran Project, but everything that I've experienced has exceeded my expectations, if there were any. The real reason I took this class was to understand veterans, was to understand what actually happens in war, what happened in Vietnam, the people who fought in Vietnam, and has actually influenced my life quite a bit. This class has helped me change my career slightly in wanting to help veterans with PTSD try and live a better life through therapeutic recreation. This documentary has influenced my life more than I ever had foreseen. This documentary that I've created has affected my life and influenced my life permanently and I wouldn't change a thing. Now I can't imagine not knowing John Page, not meeting his wife, not learning about his family, his history, his legacy, and being able to show that and being able to display that for other people is honestly more than I could ever ask for. It's such a great thing and I'm privileged to be where I am and to have the honor of telling a story, the honor of meeting him, the honor of being in his life and him being in mine. And for that, I am forever grateful. John Page, I cannot thank you enough for serving our country, for fighting in Vietnam, for being the person you are, and for letting me create your doc. Thank you for all of your service to our country, and God bless.